Trevon Diggs incident right after Sunday night's Cowboy game in Santa Clara caught my eye and opened my eyes and flashed me back to all the locker room confrontations I had with so many players and so many coaches and so many general managers and owners and athletic directors, so many battles. Just goes with the territory when you do this the way I do this. But this one obviously was very different because of the times we live in. This time, Trevon Diggs went straight to his locker after the Cowboys had lost 30 to 24, and he obviously checked his phone. This is within minutes of end of game. I'm just guessing a friend or a family member had texted him what Mike Leslie of WFAA TV in Dallas had tweeted about Trevon, and that the friend or family member had said, Can you believe? what this, you know, what said about you, either that or maybe a follower on X had, had posted the tweet on Diggs timeline, also saying something like, you going to let this blankety blank get away with this? Well, Diggs obviously knew who Mike Leslie was and Diggs had just noticed Mike Leslie waiting in the media scrum outside the locker room. So <laughs> Trevon Diggs basically said, F it. And in full uniform, walked right back out of the locker room door and confronted Leslie for sounding like he questioned Diggs' effort. This is in the tweet, but he, Diggs' effort on that long catch and run completion to George Kittle. And as I watched the video of this confrontation, I'm thinking, good God, what if there had been an internet? And a Twitter back in my days in press boxes at Dallas Cowboy games from C to shining C. The way I tweet, no holes barred, no kid gloves while I type. I see it, I say it. And I remind you, I didn't miss attending and covering a Cowboy home or road game for, I think it was 18 straight years when I was in Dallas. So... <laughs> You can imagine what would have happened if I'd gone straight down to the locker room to interview players after tweeting away up in the press box. World War III would have happened. I might have had to wear a helmet and shoulder pads in the locker room. My tweets would have been potentially instant fighting words for a lot of players I covered over the many years I've done this. Mike Leslie posted the video of the Kittle play, and, and he did ask a valid question. It was just a question that he sort of threw up into the ether. What is Trevon Diggs doing on this play? It was simple as that. Now, to my eye, Diggs did not give his best, most intense, committed, chase-down effort on the play, though he did stay with it, and – he, he hung in until the bitter end when he did help push Kittle down and out of bounds. So you got to give him that. But as a veteran of locker room battles, I, I'm going to give Diggs a passing grade for the way he handled himself. I'll, I'll give him a B for the way he, he, he just comported himself during and then after the confrontation. Diggs said on Micah Parsons' podcast on Monday – that he did let his emotions get the best of him. That's a quote. I thought it was at least a form of apology. And I got to tell you, it did take some guts to go confront Mike Leslie while Leslie was standing in the midst of all the other waiting reporters. So remember, Diggs was flying solo here. He left his turf inside the locker room turf, and he did go one on media outside the locker room. Give you high marks for that. Guts. Respect. Obviously, Diggs was upset. He was near his breaking point, and he did reach for the age-old bogus argument of, you don't play, so you don't know anything, which is not always true. I, not in my case. I, I, I know a lot. I'll challenge any current 
former football player, on what I tweet about them, what I say about them on this show, on any show. I, I will challenge them. They can come on here. They can w- whatever. I know what I'm talking about. But again, high marks to Trevon Diggs because he didn't get nasty personal. He didn't curse. He didn't challenge Leslie to a fight. I've been there and done that. Didn't fight, but I've been there and heard that. So here's what Diggs said to Leslie. Took from that? Out of that whole play, that's what you took from that? You don't know football. You can't do nothing that I do. You can't go out there and do nothing. Stay in your lane, buddy. buddy. Stop playing me, bro. Just asking the question, Trayvon. I mean, I'm happy to have you answer the question. Out of that whole play, that's what you took from that? That's what you got from that? That whole play, that's what you got from that? I'm asking you. We can talk about it more. What, 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 what were you doing then? Okay, not exactly the ugliest confrontation I've ever seen or been involved in. All in all, Diggs kept it barely in bounds. In my day, the confrontations I experienced usually happened on Wednesday or Thursday in the practice field locker room at the facility. This is after players or coaches had been able to read on Monday what I'd written for the actual news. We used to actually have these things called newspapers you held in your hand. They hit the doorsteps at whatever, 6 a.m. on Monday morning. There were no tweets, so there was no instant anger. Then again, if in Sunday's paper, which the Cowboys could read especially at home games, if I had predicted the Cowboys would lose and they won, they often let me have it in the locker room after they had won. But this usually was was kind of a team thing, not an individual player lashing back. So I would always stand up for myself. I would defend my pick. But in the end, the scoreboard said I was obviously wrong. You got me. I was wrong. And I could do that fairly good-naturedly, as was most of the abuse I took when I picked against the Cowboys. But hey, those Wednesday-Thursday confrontations in the locker room, they could get ugly, which meant they were usually useless to me because an individual player was defending his honor, his performance, in front of a number of his teammates. He was putting on a macho show for them, and there was no room for constructive conversation. Tell me where you think I'm wrong, and I'll tell you exactly why I wrote what I wrote. With teammates watching and profanity and emotions flying, no way for rational give and take between me and said player. Now, what I learned to do over the years, once I had a radio show, then I had a TV show, was to say, hey, join me on air. Let's air this out. In public, you can have all the time you want to tell me exactly why I'm wrong, then I will respond, and then you can go back, and we'll go back and forth and back and forth. That's what I, I think, very successfully did several times with Terrell Owens, several times with Chad Johnson, one big time with Chris Bosh, back in my Dallas days with Mark Aguirre on radio, You probably won't remember Cowboys' first rounder out of Nebraska, Danny Noonan. Big battle with him on radio. It was classic. It was epic. It was instant classic. And I had many radio battles, as well as clubhouse battles, with Rangers manager Bobby Valentine. Did he and I ever have some shouting matches? But you know what? I found that every time I had it out with a player or a coach or a manager on radio or TV— my relationship with said targets of criticism always improved. These exchanges for me were always ultimately rewarding as as we were just able to, to learn about each other without losing our tempers the way we might do in private. Love those confrontations publicly so that you can watch maybe pick sides as we went back and forth about why I wrote or said what I wrote or said with said player, coach, manager, whoever. So in, in locker rooms, I had so many confrontations with players over their, just over their performances. Man, 
just bits here and there. Emmett Smith, Daryl Johnston, Troy Aikman, Charles Haley, assistant coaches from Gene Stallings to Ernie Stotner, Norv Turner, Butch Davis, and occasionally with Jimmy Johnson. But I've told this story before. I'll tell it quickly again just to remind you of the scariest confrontation I ever had, speaking of Jimmy Johnson, was actually in the Jimmy Jerry third season, the 1991 season, when they were already breaking through and shocking the NFL world. And they did make the playoffs that year. You longtime hardcore fans will remember. And that team, without Troy at quarterback, he had sprained his knee, with Steve Berline at quarterback, they went to Chicago and beat Mike Ditka's Bears, Jim Harbaugh at quarterback. It was a stunner. And then they had to go play Detroit at Detroit when everybody thought, uh-oh, they got to deal with Barry Sanders. And it was actually Eric Kramer. You probably don't even remember Eric Kramer. The immortal Eric Kramer threw a party on the Dallas Cowboys. They lost 38-6 to that day. As fate would have it, I was going to hitch a ride on the team plane home. It just fit into my schedule. They said, we have an open seat. You're welcome. And I was typing my column about that debacle as we flew back to Dallas. And maybe an hour into the flight, we're up and running. I'm deep into my writing. And all of a sudden, somebody in the back gets on the PA system, it was a player, and says, Skip Bayless, you are wanted in the back of the plane. I look around, I'm in the media section there, I don't know, eight or ten media people there, maybe 20. And everybody looked at me and said, no, don't, don't go. It's too crazy back there. Those cowboys were known to take a little something on the flight to make them feel better, especially after a loss. They were literally flying high at that point. But I never duck confrontations. I never shy away. And I just said, no, I'm going back there. So I went back into the belly of the beast. I walked all the way through the players section, which was the coach section, all the way to the back, where I found Mark Tuane waiting for me. Mark Tuane out of UCLA was a former defensive tackle who had beefed up with the athletic ability that he had to 300-plus pounds to become one of the best left tackles in the business, a pro bowler, an all-pro, Troy Aikman's blindside protector, and he was about to protect Troy one more time, even though the season was over and we were standing near the bathroom. I was actually up against the bathroom door in the back of the team plane. And Mark began to question me about why I hadn't supported Troy harder through a rough period for the football team. Well, Troy was out for whatever it was, four weeks. And yet, even though Troy was healthy enough to play actually at Chicago and definitely at Detroit, Steve Berline was on fire. This team had ignited around Steve Berline, who was more of a veteran quarterback than Troy was at that point. I'd gotten no Steve. I like Steve. I like Troy. But Steve was the flavor of the month in Dallas, Texas. Trust me. And, yeah, I had jumped on his bandwagon because it was rolling way ahead of schedule. Out of nowhere, the Dallas Cowboys had won a playoff game with Steve Berline at quarterback in Chicago against Ditka and Jim Harbaugh. Well, what was I supposed to do? Jimmy Johnson himself said, no. I'm sticking with Steve Berline for the next playoff game, which was that playoff game in Detroit. And Tuna didn't seem exactly in his right mind. I'd heard many stories about Wednesday off nights, training camp in Thousand Oaks, California. <sighs> Some things that players had seen Mark do in bars. He was a bad you-know-what, and he was in a bad mood about why I had jumped on Steve Berline's bandwagon. I said, Mark, your coach jumped on his bandwagon. Your coach is the one who played him. I didn't play him. I know Troy was available, but I didn't play him. Troy got in late, and the, he got thrown into garbage time, which I thought was 
way beneath Troy's dignity, but that's what happened. It was a disaster on all fronts. Let's start over. Let's take two. And you know what was about to happen the next year with Troy at quarterback. They were about to go break through and win the Super Bowl. But the point was, I'm losing this confrontation because it's not rational. And now a whole bunch of players have gathered around because they're all afraid of Mark Tuanay. Even Troy was there watching this take place, but nobody had the guts to step in and say, Mark, that's enough. And I wasn't sure where this one was going to go because I was going to lose this one because it started to feel like it was getting physical because Mark Tuanay began to push my shoulders against the bathroom door behind me. Boom, 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 as he made his points. And he's got that look in his eye where I, I'm thinking, is, is he just going to bust me in the mouth? Highly capable. And what am I going to do about that? I'm, this is in my hardcore running days. I, I don't know what I weighed, 155 pounds, 5, 10, 11, whatever. I, I, I got no chance against that guy in this situation. Th this is going nowhere fast. And all of a sudden, the blue sea parts, speaking of Dallas Cowboys metallic blue, and I see Jimmy Johnson, who's come all the way from first class to the rear of the plane because somebody has tipped him off that something really bad is about to go down in the back of the plane. And Jimmy is furious with everybody, including me. And Jimmy points to every single player, starting with Mark Tuanay, you go sit down and you go sit down and you and you sit down. And then he turns to me and he says, and you get the hell back to your seat. Well, Jimmy Johnson might have saved my life because that was the closest I ever got to a truly physical confrontation with Mark Tuane. Whew. Glad I didn't have Twitter then. <laughs>